a listener production. Hey, Simon Beaton here with The Briefing. When I talk about the stereotype of someone who is lonely, what sort of person comes to mind? Previously, I'd say that there's a good chance you might envision an older person living alone, maybe an elderly widower. And that's a fair assumption. This is a big problem, and 20 years or so ago, the greatest proportion of lonely people in Australia were aged 65 and older. But fast forward to today, and that's no longer the case. Now it's young people who are the largest proportion of people feeling alone and isolated. And concerningly, they are becoming the new face of loneliness in this country. Listener journalist Lauren Howarth has been looking into this one for us and joins me in the studio today. So Lauren, how big is the problem? Yeah, Simon. So last year's annual household income and labour dynamics in Australia survey showed that our oldest residents now have the lowest rates of loneliness and all other age groups are also feeling less lonely compared to 20 or so years ago. And as you mentioned, those aged 15 to 24 have actually experienced a steady rise in loneliness, particularly since 2008, so long before COVID. And of course, there was a further increase in rates of loneliness among young people in 2020, which experts are putting down to the pandemic. I caught up with Patria King uh, to talk all about this. And she's the CEO and founder of the Quest for Life Foundation. And she told me that a lot more young people are actually reaching out for help. Sometimes they just feel that they see the world quite differently from everyone else in their age group. And that makes them criticise or feel like there's something wrong with them, which may not be the case. I think actually culturally we've created a society that would lead us exactly to this point where people seem to have a more meaningful relationship with their devices sometimes than with each other. That's really interesting. How much of this is all about social media and the way that uh, people now interact with the world through technology uh, as compared to how they did 20 years or, or so ago. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely guilty of it myself. I spent way too much time on my phone. And as you said, you know, when you look back in time, say around the uh, time of our parents or grandparents, you know, they couldn't just text their friends to talk. They couldn't just like a post on Instagram or, you know, Facebook as a means of communication. So we really don't have the same levels of social connections that our parents or grandparents had at our age. And there really has become this reliance to be online. Like, you know, if someone turned around and said to you, oh, I don't have Instagram or I don't have Facebook, or TikTok, you'd be like, what are you doing? Like that's almost become yeah. our world now being online. So it seems to be odd if they're not on those platforms. And so I'll just bring in Patria again to talk a little bit more about this. To go home and retreat to isolation and be on your device is almost like living in a cave. You know, it's, it's living so removed from the tribe. And people think they're connecting into the tribe through their device. But it's so shallow, so meaningless in the grand scheme of things. And of course, it can be super superficial as well. I mean, as I mentioned just before, a lot of the time we're just liking and commenting on photos to as a way of interaction with our friends. And I also want to talk about this other report uh, that was mm. released called the Annual World Happiness Report. So that was carried out in partnership with the UN. And Australia has been ranked the 10th happiest country in the world. That seems pretty good. Yeah. But the data shows a major age gap in well-being. So the happiness ranking for under 30 30s here in Australia is 19, while it jumps back up to ninth spot for over 60. So it really shows that our young people are struggling. And in 2021 to 2023, young people were actually the least happy age group as well. So it's not looking good. Right. So loneliness among young people is a big problem. We know high quality social connections are essential to our mental health as well as our physical health and overall well-being. So what are experts suggesting we do to help? Yeah, so when I was doing my research on loneliness, I came across something that I'd never heard of before, and that's called social prescribing. So if you haven't heard of it, uh, social prescribing is about connecting people, uh, experiencing things like isolation, anxiety, low mood, and low self-esteem with non-medical services. So community activities like arts and craft groups or sporting groups, gardening, volunteering roles, all those sorts of things. And it's basically aimed at preventing people from deteriorating into more serious conditions. 
And so I spoke to Dr. Kuljit Singh. She's a GP and social prescribing chairwoman at the RACGP. And she told me that the term social prescribing is actually fairly new. So maybe that's why we, you know, aren't too familiar with it. And she said that it really puts the focus on prescribing these social activities over prescribing medication. And social prescribing has become a lot more popular, especially after COVID. And here she is just explaining a bit more about how it all works. The GP can either directly refer to any service that's available in that suburb that is where the patient resides. The other option is some places have setups where GPs refer the patient to a link worker or a community connector or a wellbeing officer, and then they take the patient to the community resources that are available. I haven't heard about that before, but I guess that makes sense. All right. So say you prescribed a medication, you're told to have two tablets every four hours twice a day, right? Is there something similar for social prescribing? Yeah, so that's what I was interested to find out as well. And so I asked Dr. Singh about this and she told me that the referral printout, I guess you can call it, um, is one part of social prescribing that they're actually trying to formalise at the moment. But she said they're doing it informally in their own ways. And this is the example that she gave me. If I was sending someone to a community dance group, I would literally give them the name, the phone number, the address, ask them to do it as a weekly class for the next six to eight weeks. But I would then book in a follow-up appointment with that patient to make sure that they're attending, are they gaining any benefits, any questions that need to be answered and stuff as well, and just make sure that they're on track with it. Okay, where is social prescribing being used in Australia? Yeah, so there are a lot of individual projects happening, uh, especially in places like Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, not so much Queensland, Dr. Singh said. Mm. And it's not even just the states that are actually doing their own thing. It's also different locations in our state. So Bendigo in Victoria, for example, they all have their own primary health networks. And health experts like Dr. Singh want to bring them all together under one umbrella and have a national register. She described it as a resource directory so that there's an easy path way for referral for GPs and primary care workers. Okay, so it's a bit patchy in between different states and even different areas of, of Australia more specifically. Is this being used elsewhere around the world? Yeah, there's a bit of data floating around and around 30 countries are part of this thing called the International Social Prescribing Collaborative. So this was a newer group created to gather social prescribing updates from countries every six weeks. And for example, the UK, they've been doing it for years now and it's considered an important part of its national healthcare strategy. And because it is more personalised care, it means people have more choice and control over the way that their care is planned and delivered and also what matters to them rather than just getting medication to to take. And I'll just bring in Dr. Singh back in for this one just to tell us a bit more about how successful it has been in the UK. They've proven multiple times that it reduces GP visits and emergency department visits by about 20%. In Canada, it's also shown that it has an amazing return on investment for every dollar that you spend in social prescribing, you can have a return on investment of about $4.50, which is amazing. So here in Australia, we know now that there is evidence around and we really need to put it into action on a national level. And that's what we're working at now. Yeah, I'm glad that we're placing emphasis on this. Uh, And when I was kind of looking at this as well, Lauren, I think one of the important things to mention is that it's okay to reach out for help. Like according to Reach Out, the biggest barrier to young people seeking help is stigma and embarrassment. Yeah, for sure. And I spoke to Dr. Singh about this as well, because it is an important point to make. And she also wanted to make sure that anyone who's listening to this, who might be thinking about finding support to know that they're not alone. And it is okay to ask someone and just say, hey, like I need some help here. And she told me that one in five GP visits actually have a social component to the conversation. Mm. And roughly one in two also has a mental health component to it. So, you know, your doctors, they're there to help. They're not going to judge you. We're really wanting to look at the whole person. You know, it's a holistic approach. We need to be thorough. And we know that social isolation now is one of the independent risk factors, similar to smoking, similar to obesity, similar to physical inactivity. So we need to place as much importance, if not more, on that. That is so true. Lauren, thank you so much for bringing this 
important issue of loneliness uh, to the forefront and telling us more about it. No worries. Thanks for having me. And a quick reminder, if you or someone you know is struggling, call Lifeline right now on 13 11 14. That's all we have time for today. If you enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, click subscribe so you never miss another one. We'll be back again in your feed sooner than you know. My name is Simon Beaton. See you soon. Listener.